Hello! This is the second part of my interpolation tutorial. And what was going on before? Well, we have this digital elevation model right here. And from this digital elevation model, I extracted the height at some random point locations that I clicked. And then we used only these points and the associated height to interpolate a continuous surface that ideally should come relatively close to my initial DEM. So far, we have tried two different interpolation methods namely nearest neighbor, where the grid nodes are just assigned the elevation value of the closest point, and then moving average interpolation, where we assign the average of all points within a predefined search ellipse. Now you must admit both of these approaches don't really produce a very natural landscape. This becomes even clearer if we look at these two interpolated rasters in 3D. So let's see if we can do better than that. You might remember that GDAO offers two more interpolation algorithms that we haven't talked about yet, and these are inverse distance to a power and linear interpolation. Let's talk about inverse distance to a power first, which some of you might also know as inverse distance weighting. This is a weighted average interpolator, and what this means is that the value that will be assigned to our unknown point down here will be an average of all of these surrounding points but not just a regular average summing all of these up and dividing them by four. Instead, the algorithm assumes that values that are closer to our unknown point are more closely related. So it assigns each of these points a weight. Awesome effect, I know. And these weights just become smaller as a function of distance to our unknown point, hence the name inverse distance. So our closest point one down here will have a great influence on the value that will be assigned to our unknown point, 8 is further away, so it gets a smaller weight, 11 even smaller than that, and then finally 12 is just so far away that it will barely influence the value that will be given to our unknown point. If you remember the search ellipse that GDAL allows you to define to exclude some points from the interpolation, you can do that here as well, so that for example 12 would not be considered at all in the weighted average computation. And always remember, we're not just doing that for a single unknown point. That's just to better explain how this algorithm works. But instead, we have many unknown grid points. And to each of them, we will assign a weighted average based on the points that we know, so that we can finally turn that into a raster image. Here we are on the GDAL web page, which I will, of course, link in the description down below. And here you can see the parameters that we can provide to the inverse distance to a power algorithm. These three we already know, radius 1, radius 2 and angle, are related to the search ellipse that we can define, but don't have to. If you don't like your search ellipse, you could also just specify the maximum or minimum number of points to be considered in the weighted average calculation. If there are either too few points or no points in your search ellipse, the grid node in question will be assigned a no data value. The default is 0. If you would want to change that, specify that with the no data parameter. And then unique to the inverse distance to a power algorithm are the weighted power and a smoothing parameter. And let's take a second to talk a bit more about the weighting power. The weighting power p determines the rate at which the weight assigned to our known points will decrease with distance to our unknown point. And that is because the weight assigned to every known point is equal to the inverse of the distance between a known point and the unknown grid point raised to the weighting power p. Taking this formula, you can pretty quickly have a look at how different p values change the weight that will be assigned to our points at which we know the elevation with increasing distance to the grid node at which we want to interpolate it. All you need to do is just plug in a bunch of different values for the distance between a known and an unknown point, repeat that for different p values, and thus you will get the corresponding weights. That's exactly what I did here in this figure. The only additional step that I took was to scale the weights that I calculated between 0 and 1 so that I could compare them for different p-values. And what you can see here is that if we imagine our unknown grid point at which we want to interpolate a value is here at 0, then the weight that will be given to the elevation values at our known points will decrease with increasing distance to that grid node. Actually, that is not entirely true. You can see if p is 0, the weight doesn't decrease at all with increasing distance. So all the known points will be given the same weight and therefore the interpolated value that will be assigned to the grid node will just be an average of all of them. But in any other case, the weight decreases with increasing distance 
And you can see the higher our p-value gets, the faster the weight declines. That means if we set the weighting power to a really high value, only the points closest to our grid node will have a great influence on the value that will be assigned to it. The default p-value is 2, so this green line right here. But now you know you can change that so that your points that are further away from the unknown grid node either have a greater or a lower influence on the value that will be assigned. And I would say let's finally go to Python to see how to change that weighting power parameter and just in general how to perform an interpolation using GDAL and the inverse distance to a power algorithm. So here's my script from last week. I will not go through all the details again. If you are confused, go back to the first part of this tutorial. If you have already seen that, you probably remember that we used GDAL grid to perform the nearest neighbor and moving average interpolation, and we're still going to use it for the two interpolation algorithms that we're testing today. So new variable, inverse distance weighting, GDAL grid. First input is still a destination file name. I will call that inverse distance, make it geotiff. Then the second input is still our scattered point data, which I've stored as a shapefile called points.shp. And then it's time for some options. Most importantly, we need to specify the Z field, so the attribute field from which we want to get the values that we want to interpolate. In our case, that is elevation. Then algorithm. Inverse distance to a power is the default algorithm from GDAL grid. So we wouldn't really have to specify it here, but let's just do it anyways. Inverse distance. For this first run, I will not add any further parameters. Remember the default weighting power is two. And then last time we've also set the output bounds width and height of our interpolated raster, just so that the extent and its resolution will match with the one of my original DEM. So I will just copy that and see if this works. Okay, no error messages, that's a good sign. Let's look at the resulting raster in QGIS. Here we have it. Let me just quickly give it some nice colors. So it does look a lot smoother than my previous attempts, but we still have these pretty sudden drops of elevation around my sample points, which I don't like. I mean, it's safe to say that these I don't know, 30 points are for sure not enough to represent my original landscape, but let's just play a bit more with the input parameters of the inverse distance to a power algorithm to see if we can get some different results. One thing that I certainly want to show you is the effect of the weighting power. So remember, if we want to provide additional parameters to the interpolation algorithms, we do that with a colon, then we get the name of the parameter from the GDAL web page. For weighting power, that is just power. And then we set that equal to a value that we want to check out. Let's first set that to zero. So remember, if we have a weighting power of zero, the weight that will be assigned to the given points will not decrease with distance at all. So can you guess what the output raster will look like? Well, I will show you in a second. Here's the resulting raster. And maybe that reminds you of the result that we got from the moving average interpolation when we did not specify a search ellipse. So what just happened there was that we averaged all the elevation values at the given points. And that is the same situation here. Remember, we have not defined a search ellipse and we've assigned all points the same weight. So what gets computed is not a weighted average anymore, but just a regular average. And that is 2548.4 meters. And that's the value that gets assigned to every single pixel. Not ideal. What happens if we choose a very high p-value instead? Let's just take maybe 10. Run that again. And here is the result. Does that remind you of something? Well, I think it certainly looks pretty similar to the nearest neighbor interpolation. And of course it does, because remember, the higher the weighting power gets, the lower the weight will be for points further away from our unknown grid node. So therefore, only the closest point really will have a big influence. And if we just assign the value from the closest given point, well, that's called nearest neighbor interpolation. So a weighting power of 10 is not ideal in our case. Let's maybe take 3 so that points that are further away have not such a great influence. In fact, let's eliminate their influence altogether by defining a search ellipse and just say all points that are further away than 
now let's take two kilometers, will not be considered at all in the weighted average calculation. Let's make that a search circle, so radius 2 will be two kilometers as well. Specifying an angle does not really make sense for a search circle. Uh, of course, this needs to be radius 2, so I will just run it as it is. And that is the outcome. So what can I say? It is certainly not my initial DM, but I couldn't expect that given the small number of points that I'm using. So considering that, I mean, it's smooth, it's nice. Here's the 3D view, looks okay. So this is definitely a decent interpolation algorithm to use. Just maybe remember to play around with the parameters a bit to optimize them for your data and purposes. And I will just show you one more interpolation algorithm and that is linear interpolation. As always, a couple of theoretical slides first. So what happens if we use GDAL grid with the linear interpolation algorithm is that a Delaunay triangulation will be calculated for our sample data, and then for every grid node we find its position within the corresponding Delaunay triangle, and then use linear interpolation to estimate a value. Everything clear? Awesome! If not, don't worry, I will explain a bit more about the details right now. So as a first step, let's imagine we have some sample data, like these points right here, and they have an x-coordinate and an elevation value. So only two dimensions, that makes it a bit easier. We don't need any triangles if we would want to do a linear interpolation for these four points. We would simply connect them through linear segments. And then, you know, we want to interpolate values for a regular grid. I guess having only two dimensions, the equivalent to that grid would just be some points with a regular x-spacing, and we want to estimate an elevation value for every single one of them. So then we would just simply find the x-coordinates of these points along these linear segments and assign the elevation values accordingly. So that's how we would do linear interpolation if we would only have x-coordinates and an elevation value, but that's not the case. Our sample points and our grid nodes at which we want to interpolate values have x and y-coordinates. So therefore we need to perform linear interpolation in a three-dimensional space. And that's where the Delaunay triangles come into play, because now we will not only connect two points through a linear segment, but instead connect three points with a triangle. And then if we have a regular grid, we can just find out the position of our grid nodes within that triangle and use linear interpolation to estimate the corresponding elevation value. Okay, but what exactly is Delaunay triangulation? Well, Delaunay triangulation is just a way to create triangles between our sample points. So if we have these four sample points again, there would be two ways to create triangles. You could either connect 11 and 8 and get these two triangles, or you could connect 12 and 1 and get these two triangles. If, however, we use Delaunay triangulation, only one of these options is valid. And that is because every Delaunay triangle must fulfill the empty circumcircle criterion. What is a circumcircle? Well, in this case, it's just a circle connecting all the corner points of a triangle. And if we have a Delaunay triangulation, this circumcircle must be empty, so we are not allowed to have any other points in there. As for this circumcircle, that's not the case. You can see we have the point with the value 8 in there. So this is not a Delaunay triangle. On the other hand, if we look at the first option to make triangles out of these four points again, and connect 11 and 8, and check out the circumcircle for this triangle up here, you can see it is empty, the point with the value 1 lies outside of it, and also if we would check the circumcircle for this lower triangle, that is empty as well. So this is the Delaunay triangulation. The example we had before, creating triangles by connecting 12 and 1, is also a triangulation, but not a Delaunay one. A side effect of this empty circumcircle criterion is also that Delaunay triangles are said to be well shaped. And that's because minimum internal angles are maximized. What does that mean? Well, if we have a look at these two possible triangulations again, this being a Delaunay triangulation and this not, the minimum internal angle of this triangle would probably be the one down here. And for this triangle, it would probably be that one. So you can see this triangle, not fulfilling the Delaunay criterion, has a much smaller minimal internal angle than our Delaunay triangle right here. And this selection of triangles with large internal angles over those with small internal angles helps to avoid sliver triangles, so really long and thin shaped triangles with extremely acute angles, which are not really great for interpolation. 
Okay, so this was a brief overview. If you want to find out more about Ilone triangulation, I will link you a really good five-part video series on it in the description down below. Now, I will just finally show you how to do a linear interpolation with GDAL in Python. So let's go back to my script, create a new variable, lin for linear interpolation, and then we can just copy that code up here, change the output name, linear.tiff and the algorithm because we're on a linear interpolation. As for the parameters, you can see there are not very many available. We can define a radius in case some of our grid nodes lie outside of a Delaunay triangulation because then the point will simply be assigned the value of the nearest known point, meaning that we will do a nearest neighbor interpolation. And for that, you can just specify a maximum distance for these points to fall in so that their value will be assigned to the unknown point. If there is no sample data within the specified radius, the grid node will just be assigned a no data value. And if you don't want that to be zero, specify that with the no data parameter. But yeah, nothing that would really change our output by a lot. So I will just not use any parameters at all. Just specify that we want the linear interpolation algorithm and the same output bounds width and height that we had before. Close that and run everything. Here is the resulting raster. You can see it worked quite well, except for the edges where we didn't have enough points to create any triangles. So the grid nodes right here will just be assigned the value of the closest sample points. And we get the steps in the landscape as we did when we used nearest neighbor interpolation. So these are not great. If you want to get rid of these outer parts, just don't specify the output bounds. But apart from that, I'm quite happy with the result. I think for the purpose of recreating my digital elevation model, linear interpolation would be my preferred method. It does a really good job portraying these valleys and ridges that we have here, which just looks more realistic than the dents and bulges that we got with the inverse distance to a power algorithm, like the ones right here. But overall, which interpolation algorithm to use always depends on your data and what you want to do with it. I just hope you're now equipped with enough knowledge on GDAL Grid and the different interpolation algorithms available to interpolate your own data points. I will put the updated Python code in the description of this video if you need it. Have a look at my channel for more GDAL videos and also a lovely day. Bye!